This could be the end of a mystery for this mother. Virginie has been waiting for answers for 17 years. Ever since her little boy Jonathan was murdered, when he was 10. There's not a day goes by when I don't say his name. My life has been completely destroyed, already a complete tear, because part of me has been taken away. So there's a part of me that will never come back. I've tried to put myself in the person's place to try and find out how he did it. I'm trying to tell myself now, he didn't suffer, he didn't keep it, he didn't hurt him, or he hurt him. And not knowing, but it's a total heartbreak. To remain in doubt with unanswered questions is horrible. For his grandmother, who took a lot of care of Jonathan, the pain of this loss remains intact, as does the memory of her grandson. He was very cuddly. He used to come and see us every day, give Grandpa a kiss and ask how things were going. My little curly one, my little blonde one. In all the photos, he's handsome. Smiling, loving life. Shy, to be sure. Pleasant to live with, he was a ray of sunshine. At the end of January, a man was indicted. Martin is a German serial killer already sentenced in Germany to life imprisonment. However, the trail of a German suspect could have led much earlier. In April 2004, Jonathan went on a sailing trip. It was the first time he'd seen the ocean. Virginie remembers accompanying him to the bus. All I remember of the departure is seeing him put his little bag in the hold, looking at me, kissing me, mommy, I love you, with a big smile, and off he went. Jonathan is staying with his class at this vacation center in the seaside resort of saint brevin les pins Here he is with his friends, three days before his disappearance. When Jonathan woke up on April 7, 2004, he was gone. He shared this room with five friends. One of them saw a flashlight in the night and heard a man say, are you asleep? A colossal search operation was launched. 200 gendarmes were deployed and a wanted notice was issued. A special investigation unit was set up 40 gendarmes worked tirelessly to find the kidnapper. Major Alain Corbel headed up the unit, which initially set up at the scene of the kidnapping. You have to work on site first. You start from the area and expand. It's a crazy, painstaking job. We worked on their premises and slept in the campsite bungalows. So we lived, Jonathan, from morning to night and from night to morning. Six weeks after the disappearance, on the 19th of May 2004, Jonathan's body was found naked, tied in a fetal position in this pond, 30 kilometers from the vacation center. The autopsy revealed that the child had died of suffocation, but the body was too degraded to know whether or not Jonathan had been raped. The report also concluded that the child had been held for a month before being killed. This autopsy put the investigators on the wrong track. It favors the hypothesis of a local predator who had used a house to hide the child. From now on, the cell will be interested. Is any information indicating the suspicious behavior of someone who has changed his or her habits? However, one testimony should have steered the investigation in a different direction. It was that of 83-year-old Guy. He lives six kilometers from the pond and remembers what he saw just a few days after the child's disappearance. It's the first time he's spoken. The car went like this here, there, up to the pillar over there. Then it turned left. It took the path here to the left there. There are never any cars on this little country lane, especially at 10 o'clock at night. So Guy decided to take his tractor and see what was going on. 
And when I got there, I lit up the car with the tractor's headlights and spotlights, and the trunk of the car was open. And there was someone walking towards the pond with a big blouse that was mustard colored a little bit with a hat on his head. And the dog that was with me, he went towards the person, but he didn't say anything, and I kept on lighting. At that point, the person went back to his car. When he lowered the trunk, I saw the license plate on the trunk. I knew it was a German license plate anyway. A few weeks later, when Jonathan's body was found, Guy reacted. The moment they discovered the little boy, it did something to my mind that I thought there was a link with the car that had come here. And that's when I made the declaration, when I called the gendarmerie, who told me, anyway, we'll pass it on. They said, we'll pass it on. So did they forget? I don't know. Guy would not be heard until 2005, a year later. At that time, the investigators explained to him that a suspect from Germany didn't fit the profile they were looking for, a local man. Yet something should have clicked. Two weeks after Jonathan's disappearance, German investigator Martin Effertenbeck contacted the French. For over 10 years, he had been tracking the man the press had dubbed the man in black. Represented by this sketch, a sexual predator who had already killed three prepubescent boys at summer camps in northern Germany. The Jonathan case immediately caught the investigators' attention. Immediately, we noticed great similarities between our files and Jonathan's case. The children have exactly the same profile. And we know that Jonathan was found far from his abduction site, several dozen kilometers away, as is the case for our three German victims. The profile of the victims, young boys aged between 8 and 13, fair-haired and shy, the way they were tied up with those peculiar sailors' knots, the position of the bodies when they were found, all fit with the Jonathan case. The German trail of the man in black seemed unavoidable. But the French investigators don't really seem to believe it. When the Germans came, I was full of hope. I thought maybe they'd come up with something. In the end, I realized that they were fishing. They'd been working on a case for several years and had very little to go on. Apart from a description and a sketch, there was a man in black. They had no means of identification. I think they came to us in the hope that we could give them something. He was going pretty fast. I think it was 2,200 kilometers. You have to make the connection. After three years of fruitless investigation, the judge asked that the autopsy report be re-examined and the investigation was turned upside down. He finally concludes that the child was killed very few days after his abduction. Jonathan had not been held for three weeks. The local trail loses weight. Four years later, the German investigation finally came to fruition. In April 2011, after almost 20 years of searching, the police arrested the man in black who had terrorized the whole country. He was finally arrested in Hamburg, where he lives. His name is Martin Ney. He is 41 years old. He admits to murdering three boys between 1,995 and 2001. He also confesses to some 40 sexual assaults on minors. The serial killer's profile is chilling. Martin Ney was a vacation center educator for 15 years, as can be seen in this video. This is Martin Ney's personal report. He was 25 at the time, and it was during this period that he allegedly committed his first murder. 
Attack again. Are they going to attack again? Look behind you. You stand up, snap, cut off. His pedophile impulses dated back to adolescence, as he confided to Dr. Neropil, the psychiatrist he consulted in prison. He was first a victim at the age of 12, and apparently enjoyed being touched by an adult in a swimming pool. Then he met his little brother's friends, who were between 7 and 10. He loved playing with them. He was 14 or 15. That's when he realized that he was very sexually attracted to younger boys. That's when he realized his deviance. In 2012, Martin Ney's trial is held near Hamburg, Germany. Olivier, brother of Stefan, the serial killer's first victim, attends the hearing. He's here, next to his parents. We tracked him down. His father died three days after the verdict. He was five years old when his brother disappeared. My brother is still there, like a shadow in my life. Olivier needed to know the face of his older brother's killer, even more than 15 years after his disappearance. I came to the hearing at the time to find out who this man was, who had caused so much suffering to so many families. He sat there, a stunted man with a totally unkempt scraggly beard. I thought to myself, what a jerk. I was disappointed by the appearance of someone who was capable of killing three children and abusing many others. He never once looked at the victim's families. He never looked in my direction. During the hearing, the serial killer is questioned about Jonathan's murder, which he denies outright. Martin Ney is sentenced to life imprisonment. In 2014, French investigators tried to interview him twice, but he refused to talk. The investigation stalled until 2007 and the explosive revelations of one of Martin Ney's fellow inmates. Here's what he had to say. Martin M has said on several occasions that he abused and killed a boy in France. He was surprised that the murder had not been solved and imputed to him as he said he had probably been seen in France by a man accompanied by a dog. The man who surprised Martin Ney was Guy. And if the confidences of the cellmate are taken very seriously by the investigators, it's because Guy's testimony has never been made public. One detail in particular is known only to him, the presence of his dog that evening. In 2009, the French judge issued an international arrest warrant for Martin Ney. On January 21, he was handed over to the French justice system and incarcerated in Nantes. During his initial questioning by the Nantes judge, Martin Ney remained silent. His lawyer declined to comment. Dr. Neropil doubts that Martin Ney will ever talk. In Germany, if he hadn't confessed, he might not have been convicted. Maybe he's learned from his mistakes. And then there's something else. His greatest shame is not that he was caught. It's being branded forever as a child killer. Catherine Selzak Jonathan's mother's lawyer is feverishly awaiting the outcome of the next hearings. For the moment, yes, there is hope, but it's not 100% hope. It's not 100% because we don't have enough information. 
If he doesn't want to talk, it's true that it's going to be complicated. I don't see how we're going to be able to prosecute him afterwards in an assize court unless we can determine through testimony or other facts that he was present in the region in April 2004. A call for witnesses has just been launched to try to awaken memories 17 years after the abduction of little Jonathan. For Virginie, this is the last hope of finding out the truth about her son's death. If he ever admits that he's being tried in court, I want him to look me straight in the eye and tell me. Even if it hurts, even if I'm going to suffer again, in any case, I can't suffer any more than I am now. But I need him to tell me himself from his own mouth. German justice has given the French magistrate eight months to question Martin Ney, a race against time to clear up a case that has remained unsolved for 17 years.